very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Elsa OP webinar. Hanya Bento Hanya Repair Video Masterclass. Today we have we have six presenters here, and I'm very honored to be here and very happy to be here. Okay. Mm. Could you share the screen, Professor? Okay. Um, this webinar will be uploaded to uh, the YouTube channel, so you can check it later again, and you can watch it in the Facebook too. And we have the MCQs at the end of the webinar. Uh, two sessions. Each of session will be ten minutes. So it means 20 minutes. So this webinar will be totally 90 minutes. So, so please enjoy our video session. All the, all the presenter have lots of experience. I, so please enjoy, okay? Could you share the next slide? Okay, thank you. This is a, um, this is a schedule of, of, this, of this webinar. So um, I I I invited many famous presenter presenters. The first I I I'd like to introduce the first presenter, Sajid Malik from Pakistan. He is consultant surgeon and assistant professor at Alama Iqbal Medical College and Jinnah Hospital Lahore in in Pakistan. Uh, he is very good friend with me and he he has he is very always kind to me so could you could you start your presentation sajid yes sure can you hear me yes i can hear you yeah sure thank you so much uh can you see my screen yes i can see thank you uh thank you professor uh proponent and thank you kyotaka imamura um, it is a great pleasure to see you again for a long, after a long time. Um, thank you. Um, well, uh, today's presentation about the uh, the first topic of today's uh, OP course is the uh, simple eye palm repair for uh, ventral hernia. Um, well, um, I always acknowledge my mentor, my supervisor, Professor David Lumanto, who has, who has trained me enough to uh, perform all these surgeries uh, now back in Pakistan. And um, I worked with Professor Lomanto for one year as a uh, fellow for uh, a fellow in minimally invasive surgery. Well, before going into the details of the uh, simple eye palm repair, um, some of the technical aspects which we should keep in mind is the um, uh, safe abdominal entry, first of all, and it should always be away from a scar. Um, sharp. We, we have to keep in mind the, um, the, uh, the adhesions, even in a virgin abdomen, and uh, don't use any diathermy devices or anything else, but the sharp adhesiolysis. Um, sizing of the mesh is very technical and very important because uh, if you select a wrong size or a short, a small um, uh, size of a mesh, um, it would be uh, ultimately lead to mesh shrinkage and uh, uh, the, the chances of the recurrence would be higher. And uh, mesh introduction and orientation before placement and fixation is very important. I will discuss all these steps. And then mesh overlap of four to five centimeter in all di in di in directions. Uh, mesh fixation is attacks of the sutures. And then most importantly in the end is the patient selection as well. Uh, because you cannot offer a laparoscopic eye palm repair in every patient. You have to use a, a tailored approach in different patients. Uh, the first step is the patient positioning and the room setup. Um, if you can see in this diagram on the left side, uh, the surgeon and the assistant are standing onto the left side of the patient and the monitor onto the right side uh, for, the, uh, for optimal working. And uh, the patient should be in a supine position and the arms either can be tugged um, or an extended position. Um, I would recommend to go with the tugged arm because whenever it is extended, um, uh, it, it is very difficult for the assistant to stand onto the right side and holding a camera. Even if you want to extend the arms, then you can ask your assistant to sit down on a stool or a chair, and then he can hold the camera and then, um, uh, and then can assist you very nicely. 
catheterization is a questionable thing. If you are anticipating a long surgery, there are long, um, recurrent hernia, or there is a large defect, and you are planning, instead of a simple IPOM, you are planning for IPOM plus, then catheterization should be kept in mind. And also for the some positioning of the mesh, like if it is, uh, the defect is rather in um, uh, paraumbilical, if it is uh, in hypogastric area, and you are going to do dissection into the hypogastric region, uh, then catheterization should also be keep in mind. Instruments, uh, 12 mm port, 5 mm, you, all, uh, are, you are all familiar with the instruments. Uh, well, the first thing is the abdominal entry. Uh, the abdominal entry, either you can use an um, open technique, open Hessens technique, which I'm using. And uh, um, previously, we used to go with the various needle technique. But the open Hessen technique is a safe technique. And uh, you can go with the optical view, uh, opti view as well, and um, uh, which is also a safe technique. But using a various technique, uh, you can consider into into a palmer space. Uh, into the left, uh, but keep in mind that uh, uh, before considering the various needle technique, um, keep in mind uh, the adhesions, keep in mind the uh, stomach is empty, there is no upper abdominal surgery onto the left side like splenectomy or the um, left colon surgery or um, and the, uh, the uh, and the, uh, there is a no, um, uh, I mean the, uh, uh, the stomach is empty as well. Uh, out of the three, um, you can use either one, but you should be efficient and competent enough to use either um, um, open technique or a uh, OptiView trocar technique. Uh, then come to the port positioning. Um, uh, the second step is after the placement of these, uh, uh, sorry, there is some technical problem. Uh, after the placement of this um, um, uh, camera port, uh, the working port should be placed onto the upper and to the lower to the optical trocar into the same line, just above to the um, a few centimeter, two centimeter above to the uh, to the optical trocar. Onto the right side, you can have a look uh, the optimal positioning of the uh, of the working port along with the uh, camera port. Uh, then comes the um, when when you are inside the abdomen. The next step is to identify the uh, 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 any adhesions or uh, do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Uh, if you found any adhesions, uh, this is the most critical step because most of the time, because of this uh, uh, umbilical and the paraumbilical hernias, um, because the intestine and part of the um, uh, visceral, uh, visceral parts, they tend to go out of the uh, peritoneal cavity, uh, but you keep in mind to use a gravitational force, use a combination of blunt and sharp dissection like this. Don't use any diathermy. Use the sharp devices, bring down, if you can see into the video that, go anteriorly and onto the sidewise, working in two dimension, anteriorly and laterally. Don't go posteriorly initially. And ultimately you will end up with the, uh, with the reduction of the hernial content. Try to apply external pressure if you can bring it down. If it is a difficulty, uh, then you can use a hybrid approach as well by giving a small incision. Uh, beware of entrotomy. If you feel any, uh, uh, look for other defects as well. And um, uh, if there is any small hole into the uh, into the intestine, if you found, uh, you should keep a low threshold for the repair of the intestine immediately if you found. Uh, but if the defect is large into the intestine or there is the contamination, uh, then um, defer the hernioplasty consider her new RFE or the retromuscular mesh. Uh, the question is about the biological mesh, uh, but, um, uh, but I would suggest to not to place uh, any mesh if there is any contamination and there is a um, large defect of the intestine. Uh, the hybrid approach I was talking about, uh, if you found any difficulty in, um, in the placement of the, uh, in uh, bringing down the hernial content, uh, then you can uh, load on the pressure limited conversion to open, uh, instead of giving a um, uh, injury to the intestine, give a small uh, incision over to the top of the hernia defect and um, reduce the uh, uh, peri uh, pneumoperitoneum, uh, reduce the adhesions, and then closure of the skin to recreate the pneumoperitoneum. And then you can again proceed with the laparoscopic eye form repair. 
Uh, if you found any difficulty, like uh, this is most often, this is a case of recurrent, uh, uh, it, it's a case of incisional hernia. Uh, and uh, whenever there is uh, uh, difficult cases like this, uh, then, and you are um, uh, experiencing thick adhesions, then divide the hernia sac and the abdominal wall fascia if required. Um, judici judicious use of energy devices is very important. Um, traction and the counter traction should be used. Um, and uh, I would say I would say that uh, think twice before cutting anything. And here you can see instead of cutting the hernia sac, uh, sorry, the cutting the uh, by considering it the content is simple effect. Uh, try to bring down the hernia sac and the content. Uh, by giving a small incision or using a diathermy L hook, um, uh, opening the facial defect, making it larger, reducing its content. Because if you will try to bring it down, there will, there, there will be a chance that there will be an entrotomy or intestinal injury, and there will be ultimately a contamination, and then you won't be able to proceed with the mesh placement. Um, then selection of the size of the mesh is very important. If we consider this one as a abnormal and this yellow thing is a defect, uh, Dili, um, uh, if you uh, can measure the si uh, size of the defect from uh, in intraperitoneally, this is very important. The small defect can be measured from the outside, but there is a uh, problem when you measure it from the outside, if you can see into this picture, uh, when you will go inside, then you will end up into a larger mesh size, and then you will be playing uh, with the larger mesh, and it would be very difficult to place it from inside. So it's always better to measure it from inside, deflate the abdomen, and then uh, place, uh, place it accordingly. Otherwise, you will uh, end up with a larger mesh, which you will place and would be very difficult for the placement. Um, closure of the defect is, uh, is a highly debatable topic. Uh, but I will suggest to, um, uh, for the, even for the small defect, uh, for the prevention of the seroma and the prevention of the recurrence, and, as well as for the uh, prevention of the uh, evagination uh, of the mesh, uh, place a transfacial suture three to four centimeter apart. And um, uh, you can use 18 gauge uh, uh, needle as well. Uh, uh, the uh, LP needle, and then uh, you can use the uh, suture passer uh, for the placement of the mesh three to four, um, uh, three to four centimeter away. And uh, once you have placed it, load down the abdomen, uh, abdominal pressure to six millimeter, and then approximate all sutures, and then uh, for the placement of the mesh. If the defect size is large, then uh, try to consider uh, to bring the BMI of uh, less than 30. We were in a practice, even in a simple IPOM repair, we used to offer uh, weight loss management uh, for the uh, patient, even in here in Pakistan, um, I'm doing a laparoscopic IPOM repair and I'm not doing it for the BMI is more than 30. I'm trying to bring down the weight of the patient offering the VLCD plan. I'm not using the Botox here and the component separation yet, but um, a VLCD and the weight loss plan. And then you can go with the reinsufflation for the placement of the mesh. Uh, the second, the, the next step is the place, uh, uh, place introduce, introducing the mesh inside the peritoneal cavity. Either you can use um, um, uh, uh, on the opposite side of the on the contralateral side, you can place a 12 mm port for the placement of the mesh, or even you can consider a 15 mm port uh, if uh, the large uh, you are using a large uh, size of the mesh because passing it through a 5 mm mesh is not possible. Then you can use a camera port and then you can um, uh, you can just simply uh, move, uh, push it with your uh, scope. Or uh, you can roll it tightly and you can use a mesh pusher for the uh, placement of the mesh. And then you can push it into the abdominal cavity. And then from uh, after that, you can pass your uh, camera scope for the uh, to move it forward and then unroll the mesh. Mesh fixation, either using a tacking or the suture devices. Uh, the tacking is before tacking, always orientate the mesh. Um, now, the, the fortunately, the mesh with the geotagging is available and you can orientate the mesh according to the placement and uh, place a four quadrant of sutures for the mesh anchoring into the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, because if you move in any other direction and uh, your defect, this tagging should be at the side at the uh, the location of the mesh. 
because that will help you uh, in centralizing the mesh according to the defect. If you move in any other direction, then the overlap of the mesh in all direction would be very difficult. And then you can also use the um, uh, uh, absorb attack um, uh, for the proper mesh anchoring. And after the mesh anchoring, the side, you can see into the upper video that uh, uh, the continuous suture are being placed for the uh, proper mesh anchoring to the anterior abdominal wall. Um, I will omit this slide uh, because uh, this is about laparoscopic iPhone Plus. Dr. Sudeep will show this one. Uh, the last, in the end, I would say that uh, please keep in mind uh, all these steps and uh, uh, for a safe laparoscopic eye palm repair, it should be a safe access, sharp adhesive assays, which and don't use any energy devices. If you have to, then it should be. Um, uh, if you have to, then should be a very judicious use, and you need to be very cautious about using it. Um, educate mesh coverage in all uh, in all directions. Defect closure should be considered in all cases and the proper fixation is the mainstay for uh, prevention of the recurrence. Not every ventral hernia is suitable for the laparoscopic repair. So you need to titrate, you have to use a tailored approach. Either you can go with an open technique or the laparoscopic or with the different modalities. Uh, the rest of the speakers are going to discuss this one. Thank you so much. Sajid, uh, it's very beautiful slides and videos. And uh, the next speaker, Sajid, uh, is now in the in the uh, urgent um, call from the from the others. So I I want to present my slides first, and then uh, Sajid's presentation will come later. Is it okay? I I like to share my screen. Uh, would you okay? Okay. The next presentation of, of me is a tap repair, about the tap repair. Okay, hello again, everyone. I'm Kiyotaka Imamura from Japan, and I'm very honored to be here as a coordinator and speaker. Please, um, please call me Kiyo. Um, I started ETEP in 2018 and have experienced 41 cases so far. Just like you, I'm also doing my best to learn new operation techniques and enhance my knowledge. I know that it is very easy to get confused during the operation due to the many unfamiliar anatomies that we have to deal with all the time. Let me guide you through the different steps of ETEP in this video session. Please lend me your ears as I explain the tips and pitfalls of each important step. The first one is the retrorectus dissection. There are two ways of retrorectus dissection, an optic view and using a balloon. The first video shows how to use an optic view. I'm sharing operative plan with our team. I inserted the first spot in the left upper abdomen and dissect it caudally. This is a posterior cyst and rectus muscle. I bluntly dissect the retrorectus brain. The, the yellow fatty tissue is preperitoneal fat, which means the wrong way. I dissect it more caudally. This is the inferior epigastric artery. In the left video, I mistakenly insert the pot through the diastasis recti here, please note, the, please note the difference. Because this patient has thick subcutaneous fat tissue, I should have marked the rectus muscle preoperatively using an ultrasound. The next patient has a scar for the, for the pot placement due to the previous surgery. Here you can see the retro, here you can see the retro rectus brain. This is a scar for the pot placement. To avoid cutting the posterior cyst, I, have, I had to cut the rectus muscle. Again, I like to show the retrorectus dissection using a balloon. 
After inserting the rod blindly in this retrolector space, the balloon is insufflated and under the camera vision. To prevent the hemorrhage from the neurovascular bundle, I removed the air once and then inserted more air. Using a balloon dissector is faster and easier, but there is a trap that you can easily fall into, as I show in this video. The initial stage of balloon insertion is blind process, and I bluntly inserted the port between the rectus muscle and posterior cyst. When I changed the rod to the camera, I found a strange hole and become confused. It is not in the intraperitoneal space. This happens because during the blind dissection, I had mistakenly dissected through the transversus abdominis muscle and inserted it into the pretransversal space. I think the cause of this migration was how I inserted my balloon port. I, insert, I inserted the axis of the tips of the rod horizontal to the posterior cyst, like this. So this axis make it easier to slip between the transversus abdominis muscle. So the axis of the rod should be vertical to the posterior cyst to prevent from it going under the posterior cyst. I'd like to go to the next step the crossover of the midline. As Dr. Hirokawa introduced in the previous webinar part one, the distribution of the prepenitorial fat is the shape of the trident. There are two ways of midline crossover, in the upper abdomen and in the lower abdomen. The choice is decided based on the location of the hernia orifice and the incisional scar, but I prefer crossover in the upper abdomen here because there is a fatty triangle and there is no intestine in the upper abdomen. This schematic illustration shows the cross-sectional image of the upper abdomen. This is a rectus muscle, external, internal, oblique muscle, transversus abdominis muscle, and peritoneum. Neurovascular bundle through the internal oblique muscle and transversus abdominis muscle. Considering the trident distribution of the preperitoneal pre fat tissue, there is a fat tissue in this location, here and here. During the crossover in the upper abdomen, I cut the posterior cyst of the left rectus muscle and dissect between linear alba and fatty tissue. Then I cut the posterior cyst of the right rectus muscle. After crossover, both lateral rectus space are connected without entering the intraperitoneal cavity. When I perform the crossover in the upper abdomen, I started on the left side of the patient and I hold, hold the camera with my left hand and hold electrocautery with my right hand. In this video, I felt the right rectus muscle and I cut the posterior cyst. The same technique can be used in more challenging cases. In this part, you can see the right retrolector space here. In the next patient, um, he has an incisional hernia from his xiphoid to the pubis. For, for thin patient, we can see the right from the camera through their skin. I felt the right rectus muscle and cut the posterior cyst. This is the same procedure as before. I found, I found suture used in the posterior surgery, in the past surgery. The crossover was done like this. The next topic is hernia sac dissection. Many surgeons are concerned about intestinal injury during the initial stage of dissecting the hernia sac. I try to use as little an energy device as possible near the hernia sac. A small hole was made in the thin peritoneum in this video, and the, and the air entered the abdominal cavity through the tiny hole. I want to show it again. Very small hole and air can enter in. So there, there is less risk of the bowel injury. 
This case is an umbilical hernia with diastasis recti. After reducing the inter incarcerated momentum, I could pull out all the hernia sac. I I could pull out our could pull uh, pull out all the sac and I was pressing the umbilical area over the skin with my fingers. I cut the ex extra hernia sac and discarded it. I closed the posterior layer with a barbed suture. This shows how I close the anterior fascia. To prevent postoperative seroma formation, I sutured from back of the skin. Not to penetrate the thin skin, I needed to suture very thinly. Then I pressed the mesh. After the operation, the skin became ischemic. Fortunately, it recovered without treatment. I think it is safer to cut the hernia sac, not to pull out all the sac. This is another video of incisional hernia. I cut the hernia sac. From here, I cut upward to the hernia sac for the posterior layer closure without tension. No tension on the posterior wall is very important to prevent the intraparietal hernia. Then I close the posterior layer with a barbed suture. No tension. Uh, next, I want to talk about tar. After the crossover, I cut the transversus abdominis muscle and dissect prep transversal space. The peritoneum is very thin in this area, so it is important to dissect this prep transversal space to avoid tearing the peritoneum. In the far lateral side, it, it becomes easier to dissect the prep peritoneal space. I'd like to show this in the next video. This is a neurovascular bundle. This is called the lamp post sign. I, called trans I cut the transversus abdominis muscle medial to the neurovascular bundle to preserve it. The whitish layer below the transversus abdominis muscle is the transversal fascia. This is a transversal fascia and peritoneum. I dissected the pretransversal layer, pretransversal space. This is the inferior epigastric artery. The lateral side of the artery is dissected in the prepenitorial space. So, This is, this is lateral fat tissue, I, I can see, and then I dissect the preperitoneal space. This is a final picture of the tar. Here is a dissection line of the transversus abdomen muscle, which was detached in the pretransversal space. In the lower abdomen, lateral to the inferior epigastric artery, it is dissected in the preperitoneal space. This avoids unnecessary bleeding and also preserves the nerves on the abdominal wall side of the fat, fatty tissue, fatty layer. Next, I would like to talk about the defect closure. Closing the midline and restriction of the linear alba is the same meaning. When closing the hernia orifice, it is vital to suture the anterior fascia, not the rectus muscle. In this case, I close the defect from caudally. I use a camera holder, and it is very easy and fun to suture because it was ergonomically suitable. I use number one no absorbable V lock. It is so it is very easy, but I realize the sub xiphoid area is very difficult and challenging because 
I couldn't add extra port here lower in the lower abdomen. Inserting a new port may damage the suture line. So I closed like this. The movement of the left hand was very stress strenuous because it was mirror image. I recommend closing the most challenging part first by adding an extra port for, clo for closure. I should uh, suture. I, su I should close here first. And uh, I think uh, for the laparoscopic e te technique, good suturing technique is very important. Lastly, I'd like to talk about the mesh placement. I want to show how I place the large mesh. This is 45 by 30 centimeter mesh. I use a marker for the orientation. I use a mesh that is large enough. I don't mind holding the at the edge of the mesh. Basically, I cover all the dissected area. And uh, this is looking in the direction of the head. Here is a xiphoid process and diaphragm. I dissected more than five centimeter, centimeter cephalad from the xiphoid process. I sutured the mesh with the xiphoid process. I sutured the mesh with the synthesis pubis. When a drain is placed, only the top and bottom are fixed because of concerns about the mesh moving during the drain removal. It's my, it's my opinion. In conclusion, ETEP is still a relatively new surgical technique and many people find it difficult due to unfamiliar anatomy. I believe that ETEP is an effective method in many ways. Today, I have shared the les lessons I have learned. I hope this video session will be of some help to you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Um, next speaker is Victor Radu from Romania. He is a, he is he from Life Memorial Hospital in the, Romania. I always um, his help. I I I I always asking his help when I need um, before the operation. And he his advice is very clear and concise. And I think um, I I I think I I would not be here without you. Thank you very much, Victor. I I very appreciate it. So I always, um, I, I'm very happy to watch your video real time. Thank you. Could you start your presentation? Yes. Thank you for your very kind words. Uh, thank you for uh, your invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be for the second time invited uh, in, uh, in your conference. Uh, it is great to be with you uh, even virtually. Now I will share my screen. Okay, do you see my screen, please? Yes, I can see. Oh, okay. Could you start your presentation? Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I will continue uh, um, Kiyotaka's presentation, uh, which was very, very didactic and very clear. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, so I, I will uh, detail uh, uh, the the ETEP tar technique. This is my disclosure. First, I would like to mention uh, uh, some important details in uh, the history of uh, the. Uh, posterior component separation. The first, uh, for the first time, uh, the posterior component separation was published by uh, Professor Alfredo Carbonell from the United States, who um, uh, developed the retromuscular space, the retrorectal space. Then he cut 
the Linea Seminonaris and continued his uh, uh, dissection between the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis. After uh, the dissection was complete, he could uh, close the defect by translating the posterior rectus sheath to linea alba and restoring linea alba, closing the posterior rectus sheath, closing the anterior rectus sheath and restoring linea alba and placing a large polypropylene mesh between the transversus abdominis and internal oblique muscle. Unfortunately, uh, even, even though he uh, could uh, restore the, the architecture of the abdominal wall on the midline, he cut the uh, nerves, the uh, last six pairs of intercostal nerves who travel between uh, transversal abdominis and internal oblique muscle. And uh, the long term uh, results uh, uh, were not very good because uh, the abdominal wall uh, uh, became paralytic and non-functional. Uh, but uh, um, um, Yuri Novitsky developed his technique uh, very soon. And after one year, he published uh, amazing, an amazing uh, technique in uh, restoration of the architecture uh, of the abdominal wall the transversus abdominis release. So the difference was that uh, Dr. Novinsky cut the posterior lamella of the internal oblique muscle. Then he cut the transversus abdominis, um, keeping the neurovascular bundle intact. And he developed laterally his dissection um, in the pretransversalis phase. To understand better the uh, uh, th this procedure, I would like to highlight some um, details, anatomical details of the abdominal wall. Here is the rectus muscle. Uh, it, it is surrounded by the anterior uh, rectus sheath and posterior rectus sheath. But let's see, uh, the anterior rectus sheath is formed by the uh, uh, external oblique fascia and the anterior lamella of the internal oblique fascia because the internal oblique fascia, you can see here the internal oblique fascia is split between two, sorry, between two layers, the anterior sheath, anterior lamella and the posterior lamella of uh, the internal oblique fascia. So the posterior rectus sheath is formed by the posterior lamella and the uh, fascia of the transversus abdominis. Then posteriorly is the transversalis fascia, the preperitoneal fat, and uh, the peritoneum. This architecture is available for the two thirds of the cranial two thirds of the abdominal wall. Let's see what happened uh, inferiorly. In the lower third of the abdominal wall, all of these fascia travel anterior to the rectus muscle. So you can see here in this image is like a pocket and the uh, rectus muscle is inserted in this pocket, which uh, have not a posterior uh, uh, solid structure being represented just by the transversalis fascia, the preperitoneal fat and the peritoneum. It is very important to understand this anatomy uh, to understand why it's necessary to perform a TAR, especially in the upper part of the abdomen. Another important structures are represented by the nerves. You can see here the last six pairs of the intercostal nerves who travel between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique uh, muscles. So uh, these nerves are distributed to the rectus muscle and they penetrate the uh, posterior rectus sheath to be distributed to the rectus muscle. In this way, to avoid to uh, cut the nerves, it's necessary to place our tar cut line medially to the linea seminonaris and carving this tar line medially on its top. Okay, 
Now, um, I would like to present this algorithm. Um, this is Alfredo Carbonell's algorithm presented three years ago in uh, a Kenya sum summit in Montana. So TAR is needed when the width of the defect closely approximates or exceeds two times uh, the rectus width. Now, the principles of the ETEPTAR is to connect three spaces, the preperitoneal space represented in the upper part of the abdomen by the falciform ligament, in the lower part of the abdomen by the umbilical ligament. Laterally, the both retrorectal spaces and laterally to the linea semilunaris, the pretransversalis spaces. In this way, we uh, obtain a large retromuscular space where we can place a large mesh uh, to offer a solid repair of uh, the hernia defects. Now, I would like to start with uh, Kiyotaka's uh, uh, video. Uh, please remember his, in his presentation, he developed the uh, left retroactive space. He crossed over the midline to the right one and he started to dissect from cranial to caudal. Here is the defect he presented already. Now uh, imagine uh, the hernia is reduced and uh, we have to perform a TAR. Before uh, starting to perform a TAR, it's very important to identify the landmark. The most important landmarks are here. You can see the posterior rectus sheath on the right. You can see here the nerves, the neurovascular bundles. Here is the fat of the falciform ligament because this is the right side and I'm sitting on the left. Again, here you can see the nerves, which are the most important landmark before starting to do a TAR. I used to uh, prepare a small preperitoneal packet. Um, in front of the falciform ligament. And then I, uh, you can see here the linea semilunaris marked by the neurovascular bundles. And then I place my tar cut line medially as I presented uh, before. So I start to uh, cut the posterior lamella of the internal oblique. Always I pass uh, uh, caudally the, the linea arcuata to obtain a good release of the myofascial. Uh, flap, then I cut the muscle belly of the transversus abdominis, as you can see here, and I start my retromuscular dissection, extended as laterally as possible, and of course, as cranially as I need, depending on hernia location. So you can see here the cut edge of the transversus abdominis, here is the nerve, and here is the transversus abdominis. This is the pretransversalis space. As I mentioned, I extend my dissection as cranially as I need, depending on hernia location. And I would like to highlight, and please keep in your mind that the transversus abdominis is situated on the same anatomical plane with the diaphragm being splitted, uh, being uh, delimited by, by this uh, uh, thin yellow line. Uh, represented by a thin fatty tissue, very constant landmark, which, uh, which uh, marks the limit between the transverse subdominis and the diaphragm. You can see here the, the cut edge of the posterior rectus sheath, which in fact is the edge of the defect. Here is the cut edge of the transverse uh, abdominis and uh, my tar cut line, in fact, which is curved medially to allow to connect this space with the contralateral space behind the typhoid process. To perform TAR on the left, again, it's important to identify the landmarks. So I sit on the right, as you can see here. I place my scope under the right costal margin and I use these two ports. And I identify the falciform ligament, the fat of the falciform ligament. Here is the posterior rectus sheath, linea semilunaris. You can see the transversus abdominis here. And here is the left rectus muscle. Again, the nerves, which are the most important landmark uh, in uh, uh, TAR. Here you can see the neurovascular bundles on the left. And I place my TAR cut line medially to the nerves, curving the line medially to the top exactly as I presented on the right side. And being a right-handed surgeon, I prefer to uh, do TAR on the left 
from bottom to top. First, I dissect the um, uh, uh, fat in the bogger space and I dig a cave behind the fascia. Then I start to cut the posterior lamella of the internal oblique, the transversus abdominis, and uh, uh, please uh, look uh, uh, one moment to this uh, image, uh, which is very important because you can understand the entire anatomy of um, uh, uh, the posterior rectus sheath. Here is the posterior lamella of the internal oblique muscle. Here is the transversus abdominis. Here, white is transversalis fascia, and here is the peritoneum. Four layers: peritoneum, transversalis fascia, um, the transversus abdominis, and posterior lamella of the internal oblique muscle. And I cut uh, exactly uh, on the same. Uh, style the transversus abdominis and I enlarge the retromuscular dissection, dissection as, I, as I need to. So here you can see uh, after closure of the, the uh, defect, of course, I don't uh, uh, insist because uh, uh, Kiyotaka presented how uh, is the closure of the defect. You can see uh, some aspects, uh, cosmetic and functional, uh, pre-operative and post-operatively. All the patients are monitored. It's very important to uh, follow up uh, all of your patients to appreciate uh, the evolution of, uh, of your technique. Now, in the end, I would like to uh, say a couple uh, uh, of uh, takeaway points uh, regarding TAR. It's very important to identify the neurovascular fibers, um, to perform TAR medial to the nerves and in cephala direction, curve the TAR cut line uh, to release medially and to connect to subcyphoid space. In caudal direction, always extend the release past the linea arcuata. And uh, please keep in mind uh, this technique is challenging. It's not an easy technique. Uh, before starting to do uh, the ETEP or ETEP TAR in ventral hernia repair, it's very important to be familiar with the anatomy, to have uh, good laparoscopic skills, and last but not least, to have a mentor. Thank you so much for your attention. I would like to invite you, if you can uh, fly over the seas and over the countries in October to our uh, Hernia event, which we hope it will be in a real life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. Uh, very beautiful video. And I would, I would like to join the Romania Honey Day. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. And I would like to in, uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, so this uh, Vijirane uh, is a na consultant National University of Health, Health System in Singapore and contributed a number of international na national basic and advanced laparoscopic workshop as an instructor. Uh, I have met you before in the Singapore. I haven't ima Im imagined uh, that day today will come in, at that time. I'm very happy to be with, to be with you, and he will discuss about the, he will discuss about lap iPom advanced. So could you start your presentation? Yeah, thanks, please? thanks, uh, Imamura. Uh, yeah, it was very nice uh, spending some time with you in Singapore, and very nice presentation that you did, Victor. So it was very nice presentation. Yeah, so let me share my screen. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, I think Sajid mentioned uh, most of the basic techniques. So uh, I'll go to some videos. Um, this is a, a classification that we use for incisional hernia. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. So there's, there's many, many techniques that we can use. Uh, and uh, ultimately, it all depends on what you're comfortable with and then uh, how well you can get the job done. So it's good to know uh, uh, most of the techniques that we have described here, but uh, ultimately it depends on uh, what you're comfortable with and then who trains you and then uh, how well you can do the job. I won't go into details, so I will go into some of the videos straight away. So complex situation. So uh, it's very important that uh, 
when we do additive lysis, uh, principles uh, don't leave serosa uh, on uh, on the fascia, but you can leave a bit of fascia on serosa. So I, I hope all of us are agree with this. So it's important that in this kind of situation, you use a sharp dissection and then uh, not to use energy because there's a lateral thermal spread. So that can actually uh, obscure your uh, the damage that you can actually see. So it's important additionalizes uh, in this kind of situation that uses sharp dissection. Energy devices, readily available in the market now. If you're using an energy device, better to better make sure that uh, bowel is out of the way. And if you have any doubts, please use a sharp dissection. Stopping bleeding can be done with a suture if uh, there's any issue, but once a thermal damage has been done, it's very difficult to fix it. Okay. Uh, so some of the challenging cases, I think you have seen uh, these videos. Uh, uh, that I think Sajid uh, showed some of these videos. Uh, so we, we, we struggle with these cases until Prof. Lomonto comes in and rescues us <laughs> when we were trainees under him. Uh, yeah, so it's very important uh, that you reduce all the contents of a hernia, irrespective whether it's fat. Okay, so don't leave any fat uh, in the hernia sac. So reduce all that and then demarcate the facial edge nicely so you can close them. At, uh, at any cost, you, would, you should try to close the facial defects because uh, there's enough evidence to say that seroma and recurrence and uh, all these play a part if you don't close the facial defect. So if the fascia is tight, you can actually use uh, either sharp dissection or use a, a energy device, or you can use diatomy hook to enlarge the neck of the hernia to reduce the contents. Okay, uh, I think I will skip this. Um, yeah, so this is again uh, going into the hernia sac in an IPOM repair to reduce all the contents. So you can see if I'm using energy device, I have made sure there is no bowel uh, nearby and then uh, and need to make sure that uh, we use uh, energy devices under uh, I mean try to minimize the use of the energy because there's always a risk of uh, lateral thermal spread and injury. So we close the defect and use a composite mesh and then secure with uh, tackers. Transfacial fixation has been done. This is a... This is another case of a recurrent uh, incisional hernia. So principles are the same. So always uh, define where is the edge of the hernia defect and then uh, dissect the contents out and then close the hernia defect. And um, there was some question about uh, the overlap of the mesh. Uh, I think the newest guideline uh, respects the size of the defect more than the 5CM uh, rule. So, so you have a one centimeter defect, you need to have a six, a four by four centimeter, which means one, one is to 16 ratio. So this is the, the latest guideline in terms of uh, uh, size of the mesh required. So uh, this is a, a, a technique that uh, 
uh, that we use uh, we use extra corporeal sutures uh, to to approximate the edges of the mesh for patients who have rectus diastasis uh, this technique is called lada laparoscopic assisted approximation of rectus diastasis uh, which is published by prof lomanto we incorporate the the part of the sac so we reduce the bit space so we approximate the edges and then we reinforce this with a running uh, barb sutures, usually uh, non absorbable or, uh, or, or size uh, barb sutures. So we approximate the edges, take a bit of the, 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 the sack of the hernia and then uh, we approximate the edges to reduce the dead space. And then transfer shear fixation of the mesh. It's important to reduce the new peritoneum, the pressure. So we usually uh, reduce the pressure to about uh, eight uh, and then low flow. And then under vision, we close the transfer shear switches and then we reinforce the repair. So this is another, another uh, challenging case. This is a patient who has a financial incision and incisional hernia. So you can see the number of defects after uh, completing the dissection. So in this case, we use a TAPE, uh, trans-abdominal partial extraperitoneal. So we still have to use a composite mesh. So it's important that you excise all the contents. So in this case, there's part of the fimbria was adhered to the hernia, uh, <clears throat> the defect, and then we had to excise that. And then uh, here in the suprapubic region, we are dissecting down to the symphysis pubis so that we could tack the mesh to the cupus ligament on either side. So it's interesting how we, 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 we try to close the defects. So you can see it's, it's basically transverse. It's quite difficult to close this kind of uh, case. So we use uh, transfer shear switches to approximate. Then we uh, reinforce the repair using uh, barb switches. So we are just uh, running the, <clears throat> the approximated edges using a barb suture here. And then we use a composite mesh. And we fix it to the Cooper's ligament on either side. And then we have created a peritoneal flap and then we use absorber tackles to fix it. Uh, and we close the peritoneal flap using absorber tackles. So after the repair, it looks like this. Uh, so this is a patient, this is a young patient, I mean 30 something years old gentleman who had an appendicectomy done and he had an incisional hernia. Issue here was uh, the bowel was uh, extensively adhered. Um, I'm not very sure whether they caught the bowel during the repair. So when we tried to pull the bowel down, it was very difficult. So in this case, we have to uh, uh, do a hybrid technique. So we have to open up just on top of the 
the hernia and we have to reduce the bowel under vision. Now we have uh, other techniques like uh, uh, Amylose technique. So can actually use this kind of technique. Uh, but in this case, we just uh, made a small incision to reduce the, the bowel back into the peritoneal cavity safely. So we felt uh, uh, that is unsafe to proceed. This patient also had a, a direct defect in Luana hernia, which we covered uh, during the same uh, repair. So you can see I'm not really using energy devices. I'm mainly using uh, sharp dissection. In uh, this kind of situation where the bowel is very uh, stuck to the facial defects. So we made a small incision and then uh, completed the dissection and then reduced the bowel back. And we used the opportunity to close the fascia at the same time. Uh, we put the mesh before closing the fascia, fascia. Then we went back into the laparoscopic method. So this is, uh, this is the hybrid method. We close the direct effect. We use a composite mesh. So issue in this kind of situation that you, you cannot really tag it to anywhere uh, at the lower edge. So you need to suture it to the peritoneum, uh, to the peritoneum. Because there's no way to tag it. Uh, you can tag it to Coopers, which we did in this case, but uh, the rest uh, had to be sutured to the peritoneum. And after the repair, it looks like that. So the patient did well. Uh, so a, a take home message for ventral hernia repair, if it's primary uh, with uh, diastasis of the thigh, uh, you can use uh, LADA technique, which uh, I showed you earlier. And uh, for primary without rectus diastasis, um, uh, you can use a uh, um, IPOM plus technique, which is a very simple technique for a beginner to use uh, if you're not familiar with the other techniques. And uh, for fascia defects less than four centimeters, you can actually use an uh, open IPOM uh, with one of the new meshes available. So the, the new meshes are available as ventralis and ventral patch. Uh, and then these meshes have a hard skeleton that can last for about one year. And uh, that's more than enough uh, for fibrosis to occur and uh, for uh, enough uh, support for the wound to heal during this period. Incisional hernia less than five centimeters. Uh, uh, you can use uh, ventral hernia repair with iPhone Plus, uh, which is closing the defect. If you have robotics, you can use that. Five to 15, you may need to use uh, other uh, modalities, like uh, either use a TAR or use a, a uh, Botox, uh, which is what we do in our institution, uh, which allows you about six months duration to fix the hernia and let uh, uh, the wound recover. And that allows you uh, enough abdominal uh, and uh, capacity in the abdomen to do a hernia repair. More than 15 centimeters, um, uh, I think uh, evidence is uh, not in favor of uh, minimally invasive repair. So you should try uh, open repair with component separation and also can use Botox, etc. I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stop yes. sharing. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, we have more than 120 participants now and there are many questions now. I, we would like to answer all the questions during the MCQs. So I would like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Suwa, Hiro, Katsuhiro Suwa. Uh, he is a Japanese surgeon. I asked him to his video to show his video about the lap sugar baker technique for parastoma hernia. I think parastoma hernia is always difficult. So I'd like to, I, I asked him to show his video. Unfortunately, he has another meeting now, so I, he gave me his recorded video. So I would, I would like to share it with us, among us. So can, 
can you see the video yes good evening ladies and gentlemen okay. i'm dr suwa from the uk university daisan hospital japan it's a great honor and pleasure for me to speak to you in elza witner 2021 in my talk i'd like to present and recommend to you a laparoscopic palastroma hernia repair technique and show you a video of the actual procedure I hope you will find my presentation interesting. In the treatment of parasomal hernia, there are several issues to be discussed, such as approach method, actual technique, mesh location, type of mesh, and so on. There are several well-known laparoscopic items on lateral muscular techniques. Which do you think is best? Each technique has its merits and demerits, but keyhole should not be recommended in terms of recurrence. For several reasons, I think the laparoscopic sugar baker technique in the headphone fashion is the most recommended procedure for parastomal hernia repair at the moment. Now I'd like to show you another original laparoscopic modified sugar baker repair using the prepapilar mesh with a film barrier coating. Our technique has two original elements. The first is two anchoring sutures. In laparoscopic ventral hernia repair, mesh fixation is usually performed with four or more anchoring sutures. But in parasomal hernia repair, placement of too many anchors may lead to mesh deflection because the abdominal wall around the stoma is not flat. Thus, in our method, there are only two anchoring sutures used on the most inner part of the mesh. The second is the zigzag tacking around the stoma. The most common method of tacking for ventral hernia has been the double crown technique. In our repair, stoma is wrapped by the mesh tightly to obtain, obtain sufficient stability and the zigzag tacking is used for this purpose. Both of the two modifications will be pre presented later in the video. The side of torque as shown in this, in this slide. The first torque is placed through the skin caudally to the tip of the 11th rib, counteractor to the stoma. The second and third torque are placed in the same side as laterally as possible. If dissection and adhesion is necessary, one more 5 mm torque is placed on the same side as the stone. In this slide, you can see the final scheme of a modified sugar baker repair. The upward direction in the diagram corresponds to the medial side of the abdomen, and the downward direction reflects the lateral side. Here I'd like to, to introduce our mesh device. We use the ventral light ST mesh, which is a medium weight polypropylene mesh with an absorbable hydrogel barrier based on separate technology on the posterior side. The original rectangle mesh, 30 by 35 cm, is cut to make two pieces. One is round shape with a diameter of 15 to 20 cm, and the other is a rectangle band of 6 cm width. The diameter of the round mesh is determined according to the size of the hernia to obtain an, an overlap of more 5 cm. The band is sutured to the peripheral pattern side of the round mesh with both separate sides facing to outside to avoid direct contact of, contact of mesh to the bowel. Please recall the two anchoring sutures I've mentioned before. They are defined as point B and C shown in the diagram. To define them, the point A is set. First, the point A is the point 5 cm medial to the medial edge of the hernia, and it should be the innermost point of the mesh. After the point A is set, we define other two points 3 cm away from the point A that is the point B and C. These points are used to retrieve the anchoring sutures. 
The 6 cm band is very adequate for wrapping and fixing the stoma. Now I would like to uh, show you a video of making our device. First we make a round shaped piece from the rectangle mesh. Then a rectangle piece of 6 cm width, of width was made. And finally, the band mesh was sutured to the round mesh with the tubular polypropylene thread. At this time, the separate frame cutting size of both meshes were facing outside because in the abdominal cavity, the separate frame side of the round part attaches to the interabdominal organs and the separate frame of the band attaches to the stoma. Here I will show a video demonstrating two anchoring suture. This video begins with a view of the thorough detection of adhesion. The stoma is pushed to the lateral or abdominal wall to decide the direction of fixation. To the opposite direction of fixation, 5 cm is measured from medial edge of the hernia orifice. Then Point A is set. Here is at A. Next, crossing the direction of fixation at the right angles, point B and C are set with a distance of 6 cm. And then a prepared mesh device is introduced into, into the abdominal cavity and spread. Two anchoring sutures are retrieved through the point B and C. Next, let's move to the next step of the procedure, that is zigzag tacking. In laparoscopic ventral hernia repair, the tacking points are determined in relation to the hernia orifice. But in our method, tackings are placed according, accordingly with the stoma location and exactly on the bound line. The first tacking is here. And then, in the zigzag fashion, go the second and the third and so forth. The rest of the mesh is fixed using double crown technique. We think that thanks to the exact technique, deviation of the stoma to one side can be avoided. And finally, we usually add, uh, place the four additional transfacial sutures. Final slide showing three important messages to take home. When you repair parasomal hernia, the laparoscopic sugar baker technique is an optimal choice in terms of recurrence and complication. I personally think it can be regarded as a gold standard procedure. When you perform a laparoscopic sugar beaker, there is no specific mesh available. A tailored mesh using a plastic mesh with a film barrier coating, such as ventral SD, can be one of possible choices. You can certainly use our two-point anchoring and zigzag tacking technique as a variable modification of the original sugar baker repair. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Swa. Thank you. Um, very beautiful video and very nice instruction of lap sugar baker technique. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Professor Romanto. There is no... It, it is always ne necess not necessary to introduce you. It no. is very difficult for me. <laughs> so, but I, I, I think without you, this webinar series is not going well. Uh, I, I always appreciate your endeavor to promote our education activities. Thank you very much. Uh, professor will talk about lap ventral hernia repair in sub xiphoid lateral and sprapovic hernia. Could you start your presentation, Professor? Thank you. Thank you, Kyo. Uh, it was great to have all of you. And uh, I need to thank all 
the previous speaker uh, for sharing a lot of knowledge and information. I think we choose the best people here. Thanks to you. I think Victor, I think in my opinion is the best for TAR and ETP. And I saw that you learned a lot from him. The video looks similar. <laughs> so great. Uh, Kio, give me another easy. I'm talking about non midline ventral area repair. It means uh, a lot of uh, uh, area that come from the lateral side, and mostly they have a limitation. The limitation are the bone. In this in this procedure, we cannot apply many of the technique that you say today, but we need to change a kind of practice uh, because we encountered. The, in the subcostal, we have the ribs. In the flank, we have uh, the anterior superior the spine. So we the pubis bone. But these structures sometimes are useful because we can use them for anchoring the mesh for a strong surface. So no slides, Kiyo say, but unfortunately, uh, is a topic that we haven't touched before. Uh, classification, I think we do know that are, this is are the L1, L2, L3, and 4 Sujit uh, show already. And some of the pictures that uh, uh, come from our experience of more than uh, 1,300 cases, and uh, we are quite a number. We just published uh, last year, I think, uh, our uh, tailored approach based on our experience and also our outcome. You can see patients that are subcostal. Uh, hernia uh, after liver transplant or after uh, liver resection. A uh, patient that have a very special hernia that goes on the inframuscular between the external and the oblique be in the space that uh, usually we use for TAR, uh, as you can see in this CT scan, and uh, all lateral hernia that come uh, after most of the time uh, uh, spine operation and uh, when they used to do a lateral approach. And what we do in this case, I think we need to, we cannot have one technique. Uh, if it's possible, uh, like in this case, you see the hernia is visible on CT scan, but usually it's not visible other than point of weakness. We use an approach that uh, can be in the ETP, for example, but can be a TAPP or, or, or so-called PPOM, preperitoneal online mesh. Practically, it's the same plane of the, of, of the ETP. Uh, maybe this technique can be a good starting point to learn how to do a, a full ETP because you familiarize with the with the space. But uh, uh, same when we talk about inguinal hernia between TP and TAPP. TAPP is much easier, even though we are going to do the same procedure. In this case, we can see the hernia, and then we close the defect as usually uh, using transfascial use, using. A, uh, intracorporeal suturing, and uh, uh, we always advise to approximate the edge of the defect. We call no closure but appro approximation uh, with non absorbable suture, even in the lateral hernia. And uh, after that, uh, after a good overlapping, we used to uh, use a normal polypropylene mesh. Uh, we need to fix or not. Uh, this is the one of earlier experience uh, the mesh. Uh, usually uh, cannot no need to be fixed because it's a very enclosed space. But today we have absorbable, absorbable uh, stapler, so uh, less dangerous than the titanium that used in the past. And then we close the peritoneal flap uh, as normal way. Uh, of course, when you progress, I think this the best case are uh, they are done through an ETP approach. You can see the hernia on the left side of the CT scan. It's quite posterior, it's a, almost a lumbar hernia, and uh, we use a lateral decubitus approach uh, because we need to go posterior almost to reach the spine. And uh, you will see uh, this is the patient after uh, spine surgery he got uh, got wound infection. So we use an approach that uh, almost. Uh, uh, similar to when we approach the, the adrenal or the kidney. So we go behind the rectus muscle. We use an open approach. We can use also an optical trocker. Uh, I feel more confident to do under vision, to lift uh, and make the space with my finger or with the gauze, and then using insufflation, uh, up, uh, approaching and uh, uh, going in the, in the, <clears throat> in the preperitoneal space. Creation, you can see the hernia. Uh, of course, the, it's much easier 
uh, to reduce the suck, especially because in this case, there's no previous repair. There's, there's no, no much adhesion. Uh, for the ATP, my always worry is uh, difficult in the child, especially in multiple recurrence uh, incisional hernia. Uh, why in the primary hernia midline, I think uh, lateral hernia is the, probably the best approach uh, compared to the IPOM. So the dissection is quite smooth. You, most of the time, as you saw from uh, Victor, from Kio, you need some kind of energy uh, to speed up the process. Uh, you can still use a hook, but if you have a uh, ultrasonic or high frequency uh, uh, energy, I think will be much better. In this case, you can see the hernia defect. It's quite big, about five centimeters. Uh, we close accordingly to the section of the uh, of the of the fiber of the muscle, and we use intracorporeal barber suture. Uh, also, in this case, non-absorbable. Uh, if we're reducing the gap, uh, if you have any much tension, you can still put some transfascial suture to approximate the defect that will help you to to close it. And uh, we use a pro-grip mesh uh, in this case. Uh, it's a self-gripping mesh, not easy to handle, but uh, useful because uh, uh, it gives you a good uh, uh, attachment uh, to the, you can avoid at least until the mesh integrity, you can avoid any fixation device and then you just desufflate. And nice. Uh, we use extended TP like in case of like bilateral, in this case, bilateral spigalian hernia and right inguinal hernia. It's, I think ETP is uh, really the best, uh, ETP is really the best app, uh, application. We are very, we do TP routinely, so we are quite uh, familiar with the, the, the space. And of course, in this case, the main trick, as Victor say, the opening of the arcuate line uh, is very important. And uh, remember that from the arcuate line, you have two layer of the transversalis that goes down to the pelvis and one superior in the so-called anterior transversalis fascia and posterior merge with the lumbar fascia and the cremasteric muscle. So you need to go and opening the arcuate line to enter the, the retromuscular space. And of course, if you go more later, you need to be careful because otherwise you do it also, you open the space of the tar. So uh, simple case, we use a single mesh. And uh, another procedure that we use to do, for example, for sovrapubic, so we move to subcostal, lateral, and then now to the sovrapubic area, uh, we do a TAPP approach in most of the case, or sometimes we do a so-called, so you show one a video, a tape approach. So transabdominal, approach in partially extraperitoneal is, is the mesh position. So sometimes we, we are not able to cover up completely uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we can go. Of course, TP is also feasible and it's a, it's a good approach in, the, in this case, but sometimes in, in case where we have a lot of scar, two, three hysterectomy and uh, uh, usually most of the time it's patient after cesarean or hysterectomy, so the scar tissue is quite tough. So uh, we, we prefer to go on the primary approach and then fix the mesh to the pubis bone, uh, the Cooper inferiorly, uh, stabilize and then uh, use the flap of the mesh to cover partially the mesh. Uh, this is the video that uh, Sujit already showed before, so I will skip it and uh, uh, we will move on uh, some more interesting case. In some of the case, I use uh, uh, Da Vinci a robot. Uh, why? Because I have a better maneuverability, especially when I go very lateral. This is the patient which has been harvested, the iliac crest has been harvested and already got a, a repair, open, open repair without mesh, uh, luckily, and fail, of course, recurrent. And then he developed a very big lateral hernia. And the patient was, uh, the iliacus was harvested because was used to reconstruct his mandible because he got a cancer of the mandible. A great operation, there's a big center in Belgium. And then the patient lived in Singapore, it, it was referred to me. So I use a robotic uh, uh, approach. You can see uh, uh, the, uh, completely 
laterally the iliac crest is gone compared to the, to the left side. And they were this week, you can see the iliac crest harvested. Uh, interesting case, so I use a robot. Robot require a different positioning, splitting with the arm, uh, the arm below because you want to have more space. It's quite sometimes bulky. We don't have XI yet. Uh, and then you can see the hernia is about 10, 12 centimeter uh, laterally. And uh, we do a flap approach. Uh, we do it like a TAPP, TAPP approach and uh, iliac crest. We want to go into abdominal also because we want to see, we want to have a double view. And uh, I use the Da Vinci to open up the space and go in the preperitoneal space. You can see the transversus abdominis in front of you. Have, uh, be, be dissected retromuscular space. I don't know, big Victor, maybe I was thinking in this case, I should have gone in the, in the tar space and put the mesh over in the, between the uh, internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. But I was able to go behind the uh, behind the iliac crest. This is the previous repair. Uh, uh, thanks to the, to the Da Vinci, you, you, you can arcuate your arm and you can go behind. And you can use the iliac crest the, uh, as an as a, uh, anchoring point for your mesh. Uh, that is much more stable. You can see all the scar tissue of the previous repair. And this behind, this is the iliac crest. So you need to go really far behind. You can see the iliac crest here. And, and you, there's a hole behind. Uh, so good dissection behind. And, the, and then after that, we, we suture the defect. We measure the defect, we suture, and we do a double plication. In some of this case, why we do double plication? Not just to close the defect, but also because there may be a bit of a nerve injury. So there will be a bit of relaxation of the muscle. So the plication of the muscle will help you to reconstitute a bit of the abdominal wall and avoid, the, improve the cosmetic results. So we do a double, uh, a double plication, sorry, double plication in this case. And after that, we put a pro grip mesh and we anchor in this case, I use titanium step. We anchor to the, the to the bone uh, because we want to have a very stable uh, fixation device. We don't want to have a, the the second, the third, or third recurrence. A patient, this is uh, two years after the surgery, is uh, excellent and very happy. Another case, also same, is a is a lateral from intramuscular hernia looks like the one before but you can see the hernia here you can see we did a robotic almost same same similar procedure it looks like a similar case but this case is uh, it was uh, a it was uh, uh, after appendectomy I, I believe so so we did the case i think this was the uh, dissection was done by me and then uh, I think Dr. Sujit did a wonderful sushi because he liked to do sushi. I got bored to do sushi. This is uh, okay. Based on uh, what I show you, we have come up and we have published our tailored approach for uh, for uh, for uh, for this lateral hernia. Uh, we do a variety. You can see from simple IPOM. Uh, to a T E T P. Even though I think E T A P and T A P P are the best better option uh, etp probably for primary no much no much uh, previous uh, repair or surgery in that otherwise we prefer to do mostly tapp or ipom plus the use of a robot of course is uh, mostly uh, depend on the option that you have if you for sure give you much more maneuverability especially for a lateral hernia in which the ergonomic is not there so thank you very much, uh, Kio, and thank you to all the speaker. And uh, that's for my presentation. Thank you very much.
I I I'm very happy to see your robotic. Your voice, your voice, Gio. Oh, no voice. You are mute. Hear me? No. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I I'm very happy to see your robotic cooperation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, we can start the, the discussion and uh, I think we can, uh, we have the poll now, right? Yes. Hello? Mari, Mari, Mari. Uh, I don't have the slide. Can you please share the slide for the poll? Voila. Okay, the, the panelists are not able to see for now. Uh, the participant, we need to encourage the participant to answer the poll. Each poll is a 10 question. We will have two sessions and 10 minutes uh, long. We can have some discussion. Any interesting question from the Q&A? Uh, there are many questions on Q&A. Oh, um, fantastic. You choose the best. Um, Especially for Victor. Victor is so quiet. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank Victor, you for your uh, beautiful, beautiful, how, how beautiful people... presentation. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. How, how people should learn to enter the... I saw many, many questions about the access, uh, the space. Uh, what are the, the tricks to, to, to start uh, ETP? Well, uh, in my opinion, the access is not not very difficult, but is very delicate. So uh, everybody should be uh, very familiar with the anatomy. Uh, doesn't matter if you use a balloon trocar or an optic port or a visi port, for example. My friend Vlad Burdakov from Russia uses uh, regularly visi port. You can use uh, every device for develop the retroactive space, but uh, in fact, uh, the, must, uh, the most important the demand is to be very familiar with the anatomy. Uh, the second is uh, uh, the crossover of the midline. To cross over yeah. the midline uh, is another very delicate uh, step. Yesterday, I operated on uh, patients. Uh, in fact, was a case with, uh, which was a relative contraindication for the procedure because the scar was from xiphoid to pubis. And it is very difficult and sometimes impossible to cross over through the scar tissue uh, without penetrating the peritoneum but so this this step is very delicate and um, the, the surgeons who want to start to do uh, this um, kind of, uh, of uh, surgery uh, must be very well instructed in laparoscopy first so th this is my recommendation is uh, uh, to improve the laparoscopic skills and to understand the anatomy how to avoid that uh, you don't, when you cut, you, you cross over, you don't injure the bowel. How we can teach people. For uh, in my, if I, I always go on the upper side where there is risk closer to the uh, round ligament. Yes, but uh, it, it's the same when you cross over below the umbilicus because you have the fat of the umbilical ligament. The, the imp most important thing is to uh, be, uh, be uh, uh, in the preperitoneal space above the fatty tissue in a virgin part, untouched part of the abdominal wall. In case of uh, incisional hernia, for example, how, do, how you cross over? Depending on location of the hernia. If the hernia is located in the upper part, I uh, cross over the linea alba below the umbilicus in front of the umbilical ligament. If the hernia is located uh, in the lower part, I cross over the midline uh, above the umbilicus in front do of you, the falciform. Do you suggest to put a scope inside? I don't know. Uh, it's not necessary, except the situation when the, um, the scar is extended from pubis pubic bone to xiphoid process and you 
uh, can decide where is uh, the lowest risk to cross over without injury the uh, bowel or to to but you know this is a relative contraindication uh, if if the scar is so long from xiphoid to pubic but uh, you can play support inside to uh, decide where exactly is the is be best way to cross over and, uh, and Kio for, shows, shows, for example you you prefer to go top down or down top it, uh, to to do tar yeah no to do a etp well i i don't because know because you go from top down but i prefer for example from uh, no many people prefer to go from the in, uh, from the below the umbilical go up because the access to the preparatorial space may be easier i prefer to go from top down actually do yes uh, when, when i start to do uh, etap uh, access in ventral finger repair my preferred crossover was from from top in front of the falcon ligament i don't know why but i was more comfortable being uh, in the upper part of the abdomen now it's equal for me i think it's uh, maybe easier if you begin it's easier because you the, the rectus muscle posteriorly can uh, can drive you very well to go down if you go down you need to open the arcuate line it may be more challenging if you are not familiar Kio, what is your idea? Yeah. Uh, in my thought, uh, crossover in the upper abdomen is easier because there is no intestine below. But uh, in, if you are familiar with uh, TEP repair for inguinal, inguinal hernia, uh, crossover in the lower abdomen is much familiar. I'm, I usually do TAPP for inguinal hernia, so I'm not familiar with the anatomy in the lower part of the abdomen. So I prefer upper abdomen crossover. Uh, I, I'd like to ask Victor, uh, have you ever had the experience of the ETEP repair for incarcerated incisional hernia? Yes, I do. It's, mm. uh, it's the same. Uh, you, you, you showed us a very, very nice and instructive detail, uh, doing a small hole in the peritoneum and uh, allowing to the, the gas to penetrate in the abdominal cavity. So uh, many people ask uh, uh, me uh, if, uh, if uh, the ETEP access is not more risky than the traditional IPOM. And my answer is no, because in all of the situation or almost all of the situation, you can find this a small transparent area where you can go inside. And after that, if you, uh, so, uh, for, from this moment, the situation is very similar like in the IPOM access, isn't it? Yes. Because that's... you are into the peritoneum. You can enlarge the, uh, the uh, hernia ring and you can reduce the hernia, but the content. I must say, Victor, when, when there is a lot of addition, bowel adherent to the peritoneum, I always go in the preperitoneal space because as I, I think Sajid mm -hmm. said, I prefer to leave the, the peritoneum on the bowel than vice versa. So I don't do exactly. a very fine idisolize. My go in the preperitoneal space, retromuscular space, where it's, it's very safe. The yes, yes. It give me a good drive, a good direction yeah. to be in a safer place because the mass, the bowel never goes stuck to the muscle. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Let's ask a question to Sajid. Sajid, about overlapping also, and Sujit. About the overlap, there are a few questions about the overlapping. So, yeah. by closing the, the which defect you close and when, how much you overlap you do? Um, uh, I uh, previously I don't use uh, if the defect size is less than two centimeter. Um, I was like always put a mesh without the closure, but now even for a small defect, I will place uh, two or two or two stu uh, two sutures. For the closure of the defect, transfacial two sutures, maximum three sutures for the closure of the defect. So uh, even four centimeter, five centimeter, as a, there was a question that uh, either if the defect size is four centimeter, will you still place a transfacial suture? I will say yes, I will place the transfacial suture for the closure of the defect and then I will place a mesh. 
And the mesh overlap is still, uh, it's, it's a topic which is quite, uh, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, debatable. It actually depends on the type of the mesh as well sometimes. Uh, because if you are using um, uh, like a composite mesh, the mesh shrinkage is, uh, uh, as compared to the proline mesh is less. So uh, the four centimeter overlap is not always uh, uh, like a standard law. It's uh, ranging from three to five centimeter, and then you titrate. Even even sometime you are um, uh, like in hypogastric area. If you are working, then you um, you go you 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 choose for TAPE partial extra peritoneal instead of placing completely as an IPOM mesh. So four centimeter rule is not a strict rule, uh, in my opinion. It's um, uh, uh, but the overlapping. Uh, the selection, uh, the selection of the mesh. Actually, it's uh, uh, the question was: you will select this four centimeter after the um, closure of the defect or the before the closure of the defect. So the answer is before the closure of the defect. You you measure the size of the defect and then you select the size of the mesh because if you close the defect, then the size of the mesh would automatically will be low because your defect after the closure is small. So th that's why you should uh, select the size before the closure of the defect and then you uh, pan accordingly. Prof, I think we have to start the next poll. Yes. Okay, great. We have 70% uh, of people that have answered the poll. We launched the next poll. Uh, okay, I can allow the panelists to not to vote. Eh? Please don't vote. But Thank you. See. You see. Okay. Uh, there is a, another question by the same, uh, I think, uh, either Victor or Kio. How to approach the retromuscular space, please? Yeah. Maybe a short one, just a quick one for okay. the doctor. Okay. We have some, also some uh, guests uh, from uh, South America. <laughs> okay, I, can I ask some? Fast? Yes, please. Okay, my, I, as I show my, in my slides, in my video, I use optic view or uh, balloon dissector. It depends on my. Uh, it it depends on the preference of the uh, operators. Uh, but the one I I like to share one important thing. Elderly female has very thin thin retro uh, ret, uh, sorry posterior cis posterior cis. So it is easily go under the posterior cis. So. I, I think I think um, uh, in the elderly female, I think it is better to see directly the retrorectal space with my eye. You can you understand? Yes. So it's my it's I, I it's like uh, it's what I wanted to share. Uh, okay, could you good. could you explain, Victor? Well, I I started to to develop the retrorectal space using balloon trocar for the beginning. But now I'm very familiar, confident, and comfortable using an optic port. Yes. It's very safe. Actually, it's very safe. Yes, it's safe. It's because uh, the, faster. Yeah, because the, the posterior sheet is quite thick. It's, the posterior sheet is and quite thick. So it's, it's very important to, yeah. to uh, place the, the optic port with the uh, shape vertically. In this way, the shape will press the posterior rectal sheet and avoid to penetrate. If you place the, uh, the optic port horizontal with the shape horizontal, you can hang with the tip, the posterior rectal sheet and penetrate into the peritoneal cavity. Good. But trick. it's, yeah. Good trick, good trick, good trick. Okay, good. We are the, having the second poll. Uh, we are slowly, slowly people voting. Oh, I think there's a, there's a question. How should I treat a hernia case with a Mercedes-Benz incision or J-shaped incision? Oh. In most cases, there is a hernia in the midline and lateral abdomen with atrophy of the right rectus abdominis muscle. What is the best technique to use in this situation? Is it for me, the question? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's general. But it's I, a, it's sorry, I, 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 couldn't, I, I couldn't understand. Can you please repeat? So the question says, uh, 
how should I treat a hernia case with a Mercedes Benz incision, which is after a transplant, or a J-shaped incision? So in most cases, uh, there is a hernia in the midline and lateral abdomen with atrophy of the rectus abdominis muscle. So they're asking what is the best technique to use in this situation? I, I, cannot, I cannot say uh, one technique is better than another one without seeing the patient. It's very important to examine the patient to see the uh, uh, topography of the defect, the size of the defect, and uh, you should adapt uh, your technique to the patient, not the patient to the technique. This is my opinion. Yeah, so, so I also suggest do a, a CT scan to assess the, the defect and also see the severity of the issue that we are dealing with. And then a CT can actually provide you some information of what we are dealing with and then maybe we can decide. If it's come to worse, maybe we can do a diagnostic lab to see what we are dealing with. Uh, and then uh, decide on the technique after that. Uh, yes, because you have a, a CT scan is very important because you need to understand, see the relation with the ribs, how far it is. Uh, a, if the patient got a liver, a liver transplant, maybe eye pump can be quite messy because the liver may be stuck over there. Uh, ETP have a delimitation of the ribs. So for sure, it's, it's, a, it's a surgery that requires a very good expertise in, in area surgery repair. So then according to the finding of CT scan, you can decide to do either open or, uh, or somewhere else. You can still put a scope in and, uh, and have a look. Of course, when you look at the fixation, it will be very important. Uh, you must understand that on top you have a diaphragm, you have a pericardium, so you must be very careful when you you do fixation. Well, uh, well I, I would like to come to, to complete uh, Professor Lomato that, um, for example, yesterday I operated on a, on a young male who underwent a um, traffic accident with a motorcycle, a polytrauma, oh. uh, with a rupture uh, of liver. It, it was awful. And... Um, I, I uh, repaired this uh, incisional hernia uh, by ETEP approach. I, I did a NITEP tar, but what I'd like to say, uh, the liver was very, very uh, adherent to the diaphragm. It was very difficult to dissect it. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, um, in this area, it's forbidden to place stalkers or other devices to fix the mesh. In my opinion, it, uh, I am more confident in overlapping than in uh, tucker fixation. Uh, uh, doesn't matter the region. For example, in the suprapubic um, hernia, I prefer to dissect until I can see very clear the, uh, the pectineus muscles and having a very large overlapping of the defect. I'm more confident uh, in, uh, in the resistance of my repair than uh, fixating the mesh. Yeah, it's true. I think overlapping, maybe using pro-grip mesh, self-gripping mesh, uh, a bit of suturing, I think it's, uh, it's that, that, those are the trick. Uh, also for the roof, uh, rooftop incision or Mercedes incision, I think uh, uh, probably depends if the hernia is midline, it's one problem. If it's laterally, some, somehow can be easier because it can still go in, within the transversus abdominis. So uh, it's challenging. Yes. Oh, we are doing well. We have uh, most of uh, people answering now, 52, 53% growing up. The number is only when they complete, huh? they complete. So we, wait. we have another three, four minutes. So uh, let me prof, thank uh, all of you again. There is, oh, there's there's a question. Question. there's a question for Victor. Oh, yes. Uh, so they're asking, uh, uh, when, uh, how do you think about, uh, okay, what do you think about IPOM repair and when do you perform this procedure? They're specifically asking you, Victor. No, yeah, maybe in which per percentage you do IPOM or ETAP in your practice? Well, uh, now I, I totally uh, quit to uh, IPOM, but I, uh, but I keep IPOM procedure as a uh, backup. I, I, it, it's a, 
it's bad to kill a, a good procedure. Uh, IPOM what is is a good procedure, but I uh, keep it in uh, backup because sometimes it's difficult to uh, repair uh, uh, retromuscular uh, MIS uh, uh, hernia. But uh, uh, for five years, I have never performed any IPOM. <laughs> I, I don't want to say it's a bad procedure. Again, I, I highlight this idea. It's a good procedure uh, for, for decades, was a very good procedure, but now I prefer to push the mesh outside of the abdominal cavity for many reasons. But it's, a, it's agreeable and understandable. For example, for me, if I do open a retromuscular, is the, is the only, I only do a retromuscular approach. And we, we also do more ETP uh, today, uh, but it uh, depends on the cases, depends on the case, it depends on the uh, issue, but for sure it's a, it's a cheaper procedure, a little bit more challenging, more difficult, uh, but in terms of cost, it's much better. Recovery. We haven't talked about complication and, and outcome, but I think it should be uh, similar to the open one. Yeah. Okay, we are reaching almost the 10 minutes. And anyway, we just have two minutes, Prof. Yeah, okay, we give two minutes. Thank you to so, everybody. So in, for, for example, for uh, in my preferences are first is the ETEP access, and then I prefer to, uh, if it is not possible to, to use the ETEP access, the second option, uh, my preferred second option is. Uh, open retromuscular. Yeah. In which percentage you do TAR? In, in which what? In which? In which? Uh, sorry, I didn't. The percentage of cases in which you do, you well, also it, uh, TAR to ETP. Probably, probably uh, 30%. Oh, okay. Okay. You are not a TAR forever. No, not at all. No. Yeah. And nowadays I, I do uh, uh, TAR in uh, fewer cases than uh, on the beginning, because uh, now, because I'm more trained, I, I'm able to close the defects, especially the posterior to sheet, posterior layer, not posterior to sheet, easier than uh, when I started to do. And um, uh, I, I don't want to overkill uh, the abdominal wall if it is possible. <laughs> I fully agree. Thank you. Thank you for saying so, because uh, sometimes I see people for five centimeters do uh, tar because they say they cannot close the defect. It's uh, really a shame, shameful to cut uh, transverses abdomen for a four five centimeter uh, de defect. It's terrible. Uh, I think we need to be selective and we need to be really look at the patient. The patient are obese. Of course, you cannot close the defect, but you don't need to cut the muscle. You need to actually uh, reduce the weight, the intra-abdominal fat. Uh, we yeah. we our our tar rate is about ten percent, uh, but if we look at the uh, botox rate, is much higher. We do more mostly between eight to ten centimeter. We do more botox today, eight to twelve mm -hmm. centimeter. Yeah. Do you yeah, have my any problem with uh, botox? Uh, but regarding botox, uh, my problem is not uh, the possibility to close the defect, but uh, the overlapping. Because, uh, for example, an eight centimeters width of the defect, a midline defect, you can close it uh, after Botox. But uh, how about overlapping? Because the uh, the yeah, width, the extension or the extension of the defect. exactly the extension lateral extension between the both semilunaris is maximum 15, 16 centimeters. So probably is not uh, not uh, enough for a large defect, even though you could uh, close it. This is my, my, my question for all of uh, the surgeons. Uh, for example, for our common friends, Jan Kukleta, who is uh, um, in love with <laughs> Botox in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, yes, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's correct. Because if, if it's very large defect, especially depends. If the, sometimes the defect is oblong along the midline, but it's only five, six centimeters, okay, can do. But if yeah. it's extending 
the, the right and left, I think it's difficult. Yes, it depends on the shape. Not all the hernia uh, defects are rounded. Sometimes are oval shape, oblong. So yeah, it depends. Is yeah, intraoperatively, yes. CT scan. You need to prepare CT scan before. Yeah. Okay, we can close the poll. We have seventy-one percent as before. Uh, it's, it's a good uh, ratio. Usually about that number. Uh, we will correct it, and then we will send. We will send uh, uh, the results and the the rate, passing rate and the certificate. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to all the participants. We have about 150, uh, including the Facebook attendance. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. I pass the microphone to Kyo. Uh, thank you very much. I could also learn a lot from all the presenters. And there are many questions. We are busy for answering the questions on chat and on MCQs. There are 20, about 20 or 30 questions, and Sajid and Sudis and I answer always answering that. So very, very variable experience. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank it you. It has been a busy session. <laughs> so yeah, usually I we saw. don't get so many questions. <laughs> yeah, so I, saw, one... I saw both of you uh, typing, typing, typing. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Also, uh, also Sajid, I saw typing. Uh, actually, yeah. we need uh, more experience and we need more lectures on e ETP. Uh, we, I, uh, I think we should share the knowledge and techniques to prevent the complications. ETP is very new technique, so we don't know well, except Radu, Victor. <laughs> so we should learn together. So this webinar is very helpful for uh, all of us. Uh, Kyo, there's one last question for you to answer. Is there <laughs> any case <laughs> where you put a drain for ETEP? Yes, yes. I, 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 I always use the drain for the patient with a heparin. Um, it is an anticoagulant, so I use drain for that case. I, I, I'm wondering uh, which cases should the, a drain be put for liver stupor or tar? I have heard uh, a famous surgeon, he put the drain for liver stupor because the pocket is very limited. If you do tar, the pocket is very large, uh, so it can absorb the, um, it can absorb the fluid um, in the in tar. I don't know wh why. Uh, I I I'm I'm one I'm, so I I always put the drain for the anti anticoagulation patient, but um, but but I don't have any strict uh, any. Um, any rules for the for drain placement? I, I'd like to ask Victor, do you have any well, rules? Usually, usually I don't place drains. Uh, mm -hmm. All of my patients are uh, um, under anticoagulant prophylaxis, all of them. Uh, but regularly, I don't place drains. In very specific cases, I place drains. For example, uh, uh, if the patient is under anticoagulant therapy, not prophylaxis, for cardiovascular disease, or if uh, the dissection uh, was um, uh, difficult and bloody, more bloody, but in the end, I, I place a gauze uh, inside, and if I can remove it very clean, I don't have any reason to place drains, and usually I don't place drains. In very few cases, in my experience, I place drains. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Swag has come, has came uh, after the operation uh, or meeting. I, 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 I shared your videos. Thank you very much for your sharing. Dr. I'm sorry. Swag. I come back just now. David, David. Prof, your mic, is, Prof your mic is off. A mic is off. Okay. I, I can't so that your video was beautiful. Thank you for coming back. Yeah. David. Yes. I I'm uh I believe uh, you are the very, very uh, believer of iPhone. Uh, I am very surprised to see you that you studied the 
extraperitoneal repair? Uh, I, I actually I I do I do also extraperitoneal P A P P P P I I do uh. everything. I try to no. Uh, you must be a great heart surgeon. I try to adapt the technique to the patient. What is uh, the best? What is the okay. best? So it's, very, a... it's very good. It's very good. Actually, I prefer the retroperitoneal approach, the retromuscular approach. Okay. Let's have a, a discussion in the near future, north to north. No problem. We will situation. do more. We will do more webinar. We will do thank more you. webinar. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Hey, thank you to everybody. Uh, we can thank conclude. You. We can conclude. And uh, and uh, enjoy the weekend. Almost tomorrow Friday. Yeah. Uh, enjoy the weekend <laughs> and uh, keep you safe. And hopefully we can meet in uh, soon in some meeting somewhere else. Uh? Yeah. Otherwise, another we will organize another webinar. Thank you. <laughs> keep in touch. Uh, th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for the hey, invitation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 B